been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. I was asked to give my story, so I decided to combine my story with the first anniversary of A Quilter's Life being published. Thank you to everyone that has listened this past year and to all of you that will listen to these stories in the future. It has been such a joy to make this podcast and I look forward to recording many more stories of the wonderful people behind the beautiful quilts. that we're coming up on one year of my podcast, A Quilter's Life, being out. Can you believe it, Guthrie? It is exciting. Um, I've watched you grow through the year of interviewing people, and the quality is improving as we go along. And I just think the exciting thing for me is to see you really invest your time and energies into it and really be excited about the podcast. Not only the podcast itself, but the people you've interviewed have been excellent. And the stories that have come out from that have been really interesting stories. I look forward to it every week, listening to your podcast so I can hear interesting stories from quilters. Although I'm not a quilter myself, I think it's exciting, those that do quilt, and knowing how your passion for quilting makes me excited that this has really come to fruition and you've stuck with it. I've had a weekly interview almost every week, and we're continuing to line up new people to interview for over the next few weeks even. Yeah. It's always exciting on Monday morning, too. Um, by the time I get up, go into the office, and you're saying... Another great interview. So thank you for listening to each and every interview. That's been fun to share with you. It is fun, and I really enjoyed it. I earnestly mean that. Being able to be involved with you a little bit on helping you choose the fabrics makes me feel like I'm part of it, but it also just hearing the stories of people from just your average everyday quilter to people that are Um, doing it to make quilts for other people for special reasons has been exciting to hear each of the stories. Thanks. And this will make my 39th interview. At first, I wasn't sure whether I should do it every week or every other week, maybe even once a month. But when I asked, the answer I got back was weekly if I could. So lately, that's what I've been trying to do. And I think the consistency of having it every week gives... People that are listening to it, especially those that are subscribed to it, something to look forward to, a new episode each week. And I know you like to listen to or go back and even re-listen to the episodes as you quilt. I'm sure others that are doing the same thing that are um, listening to your episodes. And one of the amazing things is, is how many different countries across the world that have listeners on a fairly regular basis to it. Yeah, that's been fun. Yeah, even today, there was a download in Russia. Russia. Imagine that. So halfway across the world, you have people listening to interviews about quilting, and that's so exciting. I know you've had many different countries that Mm -hmm. have listeners, too, and several countries have quite a few listeners on a weekly basis. It seems like they're listening to your episode. With this being a year since I published the first episode, I wanted us to do an annual recap. And we've just gone over a little bit about the stats, I guess. But I'm thankful that I've been able to get some different equipment. Hopefully it will be better production. I probably won't be using everything on this Rodecaster Pro, like laughing at you. Or just being funny. That's not really me. No, but one that would fit me pretty well is... Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh, 
<laughs> well, at least we can have a little bit of fun with it. Yes, and it's exciting that you have invested so much into the podcast, which is part of your makeup of being very detailed and somewhat perfectionist. You wanted the best quality sounding podcast that you could have, and we were able to invest in some higher end equipment and what I was using for my podcast, and now I'm able to use it also. So it improves the quality of my podcast also. So I appreciate your birthday present. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Well, we thought we'd answer a few of the questions about myself. So using Guthrie to interview me a little bit here. So why don't we go into that? Yes, this will be a nice switch for me since since I don't have an interview podcast with my Wisdom Trek podcast. This is a special opportunity for me to interview you, Paula, on some of the questions that you ask your interviewees each week on your podcast. So this gives... Those that listen to your podcast, an opportunity to hear a little bit about you, which I think is special. Now let's start out with, where were you born and raised? And tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up. I, you know, my childhood was, although it had similarities, was quite different than yours. So tell me a little bit about where you were born and raised and just some of your childhood experiences. Well, I was born in California, in Westminster, California. That's near Anaheim. Uh, my parents moved out there. My dad was a pastor, and he was a church planter. So that meant that he was starting churches, and a group of people had asked him to come to California to start a church. Now, that's interesting. There's certainly a switch. Where was he from? He grew up in New York State, and my mom was from the state of Pennsylvania. They met at college and then had a few churches out this way, and then they headed out to California. That's quite a distance for a young couple to go. It was. Back then, it might as well have been clear around the world. We rarely got back to see family. Yeah, that was a long way away, um, especially um, back in the 50s um, when your parents headed out to California. Yeah, when they headed out, yeah. What was your experience around Anaheim in Southern California? Well, I really don't have any memories from Southern California because when I was two... They moved to Northern California. But one story they told was my dad had a part-time job working for Bank of America, and he would take money from branch to branch. And the police uncovered a plot, I guess you'd say, to kill the driver and take the money. And so my dad's life was saved because they uncovered that plot before they were able to do it. Well, that really had to impact your parents, I would think. The possibility of the driver being um, killed hauling the money. Now, did your dad drive a, um armored vehicle of some sort? or was No, it it's just a regular car from my understanding. Oh, so they took money between the branches just in his regular car? Yeah. I bet they don't do that anymore. Yes, that's probably not permitted anymore. <laughs> So he was also worked for a bank, and he was a preacher also? Yeah, and then we moved up to Sonoma, California, and he had a church up there. But at one point, he decided his voice just wasn't strong enough to keep preaching, so he decided to go to work full-time for Bank of America. Okay, and Sonoma is in the northern part of California or yeah. around San Francisco, above San Francisco yeah. area? Yeah, mm-hmm. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your childhood in the northern part of California. Well, we lived in Sonoma and then Petaluma, moved up to Willits and then down to Runnert Park. But for some reason, I don't know if it was the age I was or what, the three years in Willits is just a wonderful, wonderful time I had. We lived just a block away from the elementary school I went to, so we were able to go there and play on the playground, you know, after school or whenever. I learned to ride a bike on that playground. There was a field behind there. We would fly our kites over there, and there was a creek that ran behind the school, too, and that was just a wonderful place to explore. It sounds like some good memories. Do you have any other memories of that area that you'd like to share? Yeah, we had some really good friends there, and one of them were the Smith family that we met at church, 
Mrs. Smith was my Sunday school teacher. She became my piano teacher for a little while. And they had a large farm. They had made three ponds. They had a duck pond, a fishing pond, and a swimming pond. And just had wonderful memories of being up on their farm, running around, playing with the animals. And It sounds like a special memory, especially if you didn't live in the country yourself. Being able to go to the farm and, and run around sounds like a really special time. It was, and they were just a fun and wonderful family to be with. And they still live in Willits. Yeah, we had an opportunity to go and visit um, the Smiths on their farm a few years back, and it was a really special, I thought, a special place um, to be there. And Mrs. Smith was certainly a, a wonderful lady. Yeah, I remember seeing you and Mrs. Smith standing there, and it was just a wonderful, I can't get over how great it was to have you there to meet Mrs. Smith. Yeah, it was a special time for me and to meet some of the Smith family, the kids that you grew up with, so mm-hmm. that was a really neat experience. And we had another trip back to Southern California one year where we got to see the house that you actually grew up in for those couple of years you were in Southern California. So those were special memories for me also. Since I was raised in more on the East Coast and was born and raised in Ohio, how did you ever get back to the eastern part of, of the country? I followed my siblings to Cedarville College. They had all attended there, even though they were no longer there when I attended. And I met you there. I would come in to the dorm, and I saw this guy sitting behind a desk with a cowboy hat, and his feet were up on the desk, and I thought, boy, is he cute. I never get to meet somebody like him, and it ended up being you. Yeah, I remember some of those days. and Of course, you were waiting for another girl. Well, if I hadn't been waiting for another girl, you wouldn't have been able to see me sitting there. <laughs> and I think I noticed you in the line going into the cafeteria, and I thought, man, she is cute. She's so small and petite, and I said, I have to get to know her. Yeah, but I thought you were winking at me. Well, you had to understand that I was working two jobs, going to school full-time, and was existing on about four hours sleep a night, so when I get extremely tired, my eyes sort of look like they're winking, so, (laughs) but it was a good thought anyway. (laughs) So, from Cedarville. Yeah where we met and got married shortly thereafter, after I graduated that year. What brought us into the Marietta area then? Well, that was an interesting time. You had a wonderful job at Wicks Lumber, and they wanted to move you on to management. But an opportunity had opened up in a family business here in Marietta, And the wise thing would have been to stick with Wick Slumber, but we did not have peace about that decision. So you came and interviewed here in Marietta and were offered the job, so we moved to Marietta. And it was amazing that a month after we were here, you made a call back to a friend or a co-worker and come to find out they had gone in and laid everybody off at that Wick Slumber just a month after we had left. Yes, the Lord's providence certainly has led us to Marietta and to everything we've been involved in since. Um, just for your listeners, you know, I grew up in uh, about an hour north of Marietta in New Concord, Ohio, but both sets of my grandparents are from Marietta, my great-grandparents from this area and we're currently living in the family homestead that my great-grandparents built and the heritage goes back much farther than that so the lord has led us each step of the way but enough about me this is an interview (laughs) about you paula so let's move on and there's there's one more memory okay in california yes please (laughs) one memory i have in runner park We had moved to Runner Park after Willits, and the Snoopy Ice Skating Rink, which is called the Redwood Empire Ice Arena in Santa Rosa, California, 
It was built and owned by Charles Schultz, the guy who wrote the Snoopy cartoons. Oh, neat. And so he would be there every so often. So it was neat to see him there. That's where I learned to ice skate. And one time when we were there as a family, they had the couple skates. So my dad said, come on, let's go. And we were out there, and I lost my footing, and he just lifted me up. I thought, boy, my dad is so strong. So that was a really neat memory. That, but that's a good memory. That had to be a special time for you. So you grew up through your high school years in California. Junior high and high school. Okay. End of elementary, yeah. Well, we talked about your crafting interests a little bit in the initial episode we did about a year ago. So let's move on to some of your interests with quilting. I know you've produced a lot of quilts for our nieces and nephews' children, and as well as our own grandchildren. Do you have a favorite quilt out of that that you've made? Oh, like most quilters, I love each one, some better than others, but usually the ones you're working on right now are at the top of the list. But if I had to pick one that's at the very top, right now it would be the one I made for our granddaughter, Hazel. She loves yellow, so I made it yellow and gray. But maybe it's special because Hazel's the one who had leukemia, and she's just finished her chemo treatments, and she has survived. We are just so thankful that Hazel is still with us. Yes. It's a special memory for us. Hazel had bright red hair to begin with, and after her hair fell out, we were all not concerned but wondered whether it would come back in as it was and it did and even thicker and more rich than it did before so it is a special memory for us in a time where we can really rejoice in the lord that he was gracious to us during this time yeah and we all thought hazel would just love red but she chose yellow and she would say my yellow and Her quilt has hearts on it, made a bit with the storm at sea type pattern, those kind of hearts. So it's a very special quilt for me. It is a special quilt. As I see every one of your quilts, it has a special meaning, especially since you make them for family members primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, Each one is, each person you give a quilt to is special to both of us truly a gift from God that you're able to do that. The only thing I get involved with is picking out of the fabric. You also have to come and see as I work along every step. I'm going, Guthrie, come. Look at this. Look at that. And I enjoy doing that. I really do. It's a special time. Although I can coordinate some coloring, I could never put a quilt together like you do, Paula, because just the vision you have and the picture you have in your mind I guess I'm more of a big picture type person where I can visualize a little bit, but I cannot visualize the little pieces going into making a pattern. Speaking of that, do you have a favorite type of pattern or block? Uh, I know you have like stars and different types of piecing together. that I don't know the official names for them, but <laughs> is there a special type of design, I guess it is, that you like to, to use in the quilts? I don't know. I I tend to like to use two blocks that, when put together, they make lines throughout the quilt. I don't know how really to explain that. Just about every quilt, not everyone, but just about every quilt, I try to throw something new in so I'm always learning. I still feel like I'm pretty much a beginning quilter. But I think every quilt you've made, and it's it's been... Several dozen now. I think every design is different. Every quilt is completely different. And they're so unique in their design and their look. And the different fabrics that are chosen to go into it makes each quilt look extremely different. How many different patterns or colors do you try to use within a quilt? Annie Smith mentioned in her episode about color. And I'm... Looking forward to digging into that a little bit more to find out how to do that better. Okay. 
Do you have a particular quilting tool that is a favorite one of yours? I really like my six and a half by 24 and a half inch ruler. It's probably one of the most basic tools most quilters have, but I just love getting that straight line across the width of the fabric and being able to measure an exact strip. So I just really love having that tool. I know you have several different squares or rulers or blocks that you use during the quilting process. I don't understand them all, but I know that you do, and it's uh, interesting how you utilize each type of tool. Yeah, maybe I like it because when I made the first ones, I didn't know about these tools, and I had taken our metal yardstick and drawn lines as best I could on the fabric and then cut with my scissors So just being able to lay that ruler down and cut clear across and get that line straight, not scissors, and it's just fun. I think one of the special things to me is you always put the person's name on the quilt that you're making and then put a little tag about who it's made by. So I think that adds extra special attention to the quilt itself. Yeah, I found out after a few that we were supposed to put labels on the quilts But I do really like having a name on the quilt for the person it's made for. I think it's really neat for a child to be able to say, this is mine, here's my name. Yes, another special aspect of that is you always let them know that they're to use the quilt and not put it away for safekeeping, but it's to be a quilt that they use in everyday life and it becomes part of their life. Yeah. After my aunt passed away, Aunt Mert, she had hidden away quilts her grandmother, my great-grandmother, had made. Didn't want them to get ruined, I guess, so she had them hidden under her bed, folded up where they couldn't be seen, were not used, and they were dry-rotted and not usable when they were found. So nobody got the pleasure of of those quilts. They were not enjoyed. And I think that's a special aspect of it because I'd rather see a dirty tattered quilt that's being used than Mm -hmm. one that's stored in plastic wrap. Right. Now you allow me to tag along with you to pick out the fabric so I know that has to be your favorite part of the quilting process (laughs) but in addition to that what other aspects of the quilting process do you like? I like designing them and since that first episode that we did We actually did that episode two years ago, but I didn't get it posted till last year. You bought me the program EQ8, so instead of having to design it on my cross-stitch computer program, now I have EQ8, and I can lay out the patterns with that, and that's a lot of fun to work with. It's a lot of fun to see you putting them together. You call me over and change the coloring scheme a little bit, and sometimes I realize it's the same pattern, and other times I think it's a new pattern. Uh, just because of the different colors on it, it looks uh-huh. completely different. So I think that is a neat part of the process. And you do such a great job at the design. And then um, I like the binding. The in-between stuff is good, too. But I like being able to sit down and hand sew that binding. Yeah, since I grew up in a large family with 10 kids, and each of the siblings also had several children, we have a lot of nieces and nephews that are now having children. I believe you have, is it nine or ten quilts backlog right now of children that either have already been born or are soon to be born? When I started, I was able to make the quilt before the baby arrived, and now I think there have been, not counting the two I'm working on right now, I think four babies have arrived, and there's more on the way. And so I have a lot of work to do. Yes, you do. A lot of quilting um, ahead of you, but that's exciting. But I remember other people giving the tip of enjoy it, have fun with it. So I'm not pushing to get those made just to get them made. I still want to enjoy the process. And that's a special part of it is to enjoy the process. And and each one is unique to the individual, both color-wise and and design pattern-wise. So 
that makes a not only a special making them, but special as we give those to our grand nieces and nephews. And it's not all bad giving them when the baby's a little older. I really enjoy giving the one to my great niece, and my niece sent me a picture back the day the quilt was received. She set the baby on the quilt and sent me a picture, and that was a lot of fun when the babies could sit up and they're on their quilt. So it is. That, that makes it really special. Do you have a worst quilting experience that you would like to yeah, confess this, to? <laughs> not really, but this one still haunts me because I went ahead and sent the quilt out anyways instead of fixing it before I sent it out. So there's still the possibility of this quilt certain squares and it shrinking up. I was about done with it, and I realized as I was pressing it that some of the squares were starting to shrink. Evidently, they were not 100% cotton like I thought they were. And so I just hope that they continue washing it in cold water and (laughs) and these certain squares in their quilt don't change shape. So you shouldn't mix different types of fabrics within a quilt? Well, I was taught that you should use 100% cotton. I think you can. Maybe if if you use the same, if you use polyester throughout or something, I don't know. But they call it quilting cotton, and so that's what I try to stick with. Okay. What is your passion for quilting, or why do you desire to make these quilts? Well, I think a quilt can be used more than certain other gifts. I love cross-stitching, but when you make a cross-stitch, it could go on a pillow, but most likely they were something to hang on the wall. And that may or may not fit someone's decor. But a quilt could be used even for a picnic or to go out on the hillside, or it doesn't have to match necessarily to be useful i remember one christmas two or three years ago i guess it was Mm -hmm. that you made picnic quilts for each of our five children and their spouses and each one was so uniquely different and the color schemes were based on their colored likes or dislikes and and it was really a special gift to them yeah i actually used the same pattern for each of those five quilts wow but they do look different, and those are pictured on my quilts on the web On the web website. page in quilt, mm-hmm. uh, quilterslife.com. Mm-hmm. But I also hope to, in the future, be able to make quilts for those in need, the gospel missioners, some outlet. But right now I don't have the time to do that. Yeah, your backlog of grandnieces and nephews are going to keep you busy for a while. Yeah, and work. Yeah, and work, yes. Working pretty much full-time in in quilting and podcasting certainly keeps your days completely full. Another thing that you talked about and I think would be exciting is, I forget what they call it, it was a type of quilting that sort of looks like stained glass. Yeah. And that we would like to have, we have a sun porch. We thought about getting stained glass for the different seasons, but you may do that in this type of quilting? I do want to do that, and I even thought here in the kitchen or up in the office where we have the extra space above the window, that would be fun to put something like that there. So I'm real excited about getting to try that, but I just don't know when I'm going to get to it. Do you recall what type of quilting that was called? Pajagi? That's it, Pajagi. Is it a Korean type um, art? or? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. I know this has been a whirlwind year for you with the podcasting, as busy as we've been with our businesses, and also somewhat being a caretaker for your mom. We've had a lot of actions going on, but it's been such an exciting time for me to see how passionate you are with your podcast and being able to help you some and you being able to help me with my podcast some because of what you're learning that I didn't take the time to really invest to to learn. Yeah, I had to switch my editing program. I was able to do it on a simple little program on my phone, but this new equipment 
that's not working out anymore. So I had to switch to the editing program you're using. That was fun the other day to say, why don't you use this? This helps me a lot. And you're like, oh, I've never used that. Yes, you've been teaching me some about Adobe Audition, and you're allowing me to use your Roadcaster Pro to record now, so hopefully the quality of my podcast will be even better now. I wanted to mention how much fun it is to talk to all these wonderful quilters. Each one has a special story, and it's just fun to talk quilting and hear about where they're from and who they are and what they love and what they do. It's just so, so much fun. I really get excited whenever I set up an interview. I am that little kid jumping up and down inside of me saying, yay, someone wants to talk to me. So it's just a lot of fun. It is, and I think one of the aspects of the stories is just hearing their personal stories, Mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily related to their quilting, just their background, their upbringing, and just hearing people's stories from all over the the country and, and listeners from all over the world that are listening to a quilter's life. And just to hear the stories that quilters have is a special time. Do you have any tips that you would like to share that might be helpful to other quilters? Well, we've mentioned a few throughout the podcast today. My guests have wonderful, wonderful tips. I've picked up so many, and I know if I start to list them, I'm going to miss something. I know a huge one is just enjoy it, have fun doing it. And then a simple one was, using a weight to hold down a ruler to keep it in place. Just so many tips, and I'm looking forward to this next year, hearing more about their lives and ideas that they have. I think that's exciting, and I just can't wait for next year where we can get together again, you and I, and talk about this past year and how much farther you've gone and how much many more stories that you've been able to uncover, discover, and how quilting is just growing by leaps and bounds all around the world and how exciting it is to have that huge community of a common interest that's helpful to other people and certainly helpful for those who are quilters. Yeah, there's wonderful people out there, and I'm so anxious to hear their stories. Yeah, I think it's great to be able to focus on something that's very wonderful and and people working together. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paula, for allowing me to interview you on this first anniversary of A Quilter's Life, and we're looking forward to many more episodes and many more years of A Quilter's Life. Well, thank you, Guthrie, for spending this time with me. I always love to spend time with you. (laughs) This is fun, and... It's fun that we can do it together. It is. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Love you. Bye. I'm so glad you joined me for this episode of A Quilter's Life. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com. Or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a review as it helps others to find the show? Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website for a Quilters Life Facebook group to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening.